known as secondary tumor. If you look at this slide, so here you see primary tumor cells that get into the circulatory system and then go to the heart and pump into different organs and then start metastasizing the heart. Um, so this is a patient yellow um, areas are the parts that uh, we have tumors and actually this is a PET CT fusion image and this is a very scary situation and unfortunate situation for this patient. That's what our project and our lab tries to do to avoid this happening. So now I before describing the technical issues, I give the floor to, to Dr. Kang to talk about uh, Northern Camp. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jun Pang. I'm very happy to introduce myself and my company. So I got PhD from Chinese Academy of Science and postdoc in Queen's University. I then moved to US work for NIH cancer research, six and a half years, and then moved to Philadelphia for AstraZeneca, also research new drug for cancer. So totally seven and a half years, US, and back to Niagara Falls, Ontario, founding my own company. So I'm company uh, focused on, <coughs> yeah, uh, seven business, first one's early stage cancer and uh, disease test, uh, use uh, biomarkers, bio, uh, <coughs> multiplication and uh, multiplication. Second is a new drug RMD, mostly focused on uh, new drug for cancer and neuroscience. It's uh, I did this one more than 20 years already. Third sure, is a new technology for generic drug. Uh, Four is a new API compound. We have a totally uh, pharmaceutical intermediate and API. So it's about 5,000 in our company. And five is uh, 3D printing and 3D bioprinting. 3D printing right now focuses on uh, organ models for <laughs> doctor and patients. Uh, uh, this year, uh, we do some project for 3D bioprinting uh, for real tissue and real organs. Six is uh, stem cell for stem cell growth and application. They can get uh, different uh, cells, like the neural cell <coughs> and the different cells. Uh, same is natural product, like uh, uh, nutrition stuff. We have about 50 products uh, uh, right now in our company, and sell to uh, more than 20 countries. Uh, that's all for our company. Thank you very much. So the... Louder. <laughs> I'll wrap up. <laughs> I, I, can, I can talk louder, but I can't wrap up. <laughs> so the, the, the idea of this uh, lab and the project is that the patient walks into the clinic, the you know, use imaging analysis like CT MRI, and then uh, from there you collect uh, clinical images. Using those images, we want to predict from the site of the primary tumor cell where the secondary tumor cell will happen. Okay, so we will uh, work on developing efficient uh, 3D reconstruction <coughs> algorithms to make 3D models of the entire uh, circulatory system for each patient. Not this is not a generic model. This is for for each patient that we want to see and study its situation here. And then we will work on uh, this predictive module that predicts the site of the secondary tumor using computational fluid dynamics and computational solid mechanics. We will have uh, multi-scale models and 3D, 0D, because otherwise it's just hopeless. And uh, we, we have particulate flow and we should also model the deformation of uh, uh, circulatory tumor cells. And if, if we can find the 
position of the secondary tumor, we will be able to do more effective monitoring for early diagnosis, and we can guide targeted drug delivery, guide targeted radiotropy, and also we can guide the new precision trophies as they arise. So uh, we, we use this um, multidisciplinary approach. Core members of the lab currently are, are Dr. Multan and from McMaster University. She is uh, expert in computational fluid mechanics and thermodynamics and 3D reconstruction. We have three clinical scientists, uh, Professor Ganane, Professor from McMaster, Professor Ellen <coughs> from Harvard, MIT, and Professor Hernandez from Spain. And so Garcia from University of Calgary will help us about uh, CT, MRI, and other imaging modalities. Northern CAM will, will help us for drug delivery and cancer diagnosis, and I will be the working horse for software development, computational fluid mechanics, and computational side mechanics, <coughs> side mechanics image processing, 3D reconstruction. I would like to thank you again for the opportunity and the support. Thank you. So, because of the time, we're not going to get questions. Maybe we can ask questions during the panel or afterwards. Okay, so let's move on to the second presentation from McMaster, Tom Herbert. represent the new systemic risk analytics lab. I'm not the chair or not the chief of it, but uh, I'd like to thank Carl and all the participants who created this great initiative. And we really want to see in two years a renewal. So um, I'm not sure what the thing is. So um, I'm joined with uh, Matthias Griselli and uh, Sebastian Geimungel, who's at U of T. Uh, uh, Matthias is at McMaster. And we have partners. Uh, research partners, and we're actively looking for new industrial partners. Is Jeff Lynch here? Uh, oh, we haven't met. We just talked on the phone. <laughs> 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 I think uh, we're, we're advertising a <laughs> firm industrial partner, Hollanda, in Toronto. So that's what it means, and we're going to be looking at market microstructure data and proprietary data for high-frequency high, high finance. And so what is systemic risk all about? Well, there is a definition uh, uh, the Canadian government has deemed it necessary to define systemic risk. It's a threat to the stability or integrity of Canada's financial system that originates in, is transmitted through, or impairs <coughs> capital markets, and that has the potential to have an adverse effect on the Canadian economy. It's a big deal. We know it when we see it. We don't know what it's gonna look like when it comes around again, but of course, this whole industry has become really a widespread to study financial systemic risk has become in the last 10 years a really big thing around the world and I'm, I'm very, I'm very much embedded in, 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 in the research on systemic risk. Um, banks and financial institutions in Toronto and in Ontario actually have a clear interest in understanding the whole financial system as a network because their uh, industry uh, strategies depend on the behavior, of the, the vulnerabilities of the financial network. So um, the primary instigators of the study of systemic risk are the Bank of Canada and OSFI in Canada, bank regulators and the Ministry of Finance. Of course, they're responsible for the economy at large, but banks and um, industry have to understand it now, and I don't think they uh, yet. Um, we're hoping that, uh, that they're going to find it interesting to be involved with our project. So, um, our purpose is to find industry partners who are who recognize the business opportunities and risks associated with systemic risk analysis. So, 
We're currently very active in the research aspects. We're working in network science, mean field games, agent based models, um, well, and so on. But we're going to retool depending on the industry partners' needs. And so we're, we're motivated to do other things that. As, as, as it suggested to us from our industry partners. So it's pretty exciting. So I'm, I, I'm not going to go at great length. But I'll just flash a couple of pictures. Um, we're a little bit new in the game. We just came up and running in, in the last month. So we've been talking to a lot of interested industry partners, but we haven't created a great propaganda show yet. But um, so we think of the financial network as as a network of banks and financial institutions, and they're linked to each other through their financial exposures. And these arrows are the directions for contagious uh, infection of one bank to another. Sometimes the contagion goes in one direction along that arrow, but other effects go backwards. And so these kinds of effects reverberate in the financial system when the crisis starts or during the crisis. So, this schematic is from the paper that I'm just trying to submit for publication now. <clears throat> and it's a schematic in the middle part that represents the financial, the abstract financial system, and the two outside bars are the greater economy. And so this was a very compact way of visualizing the channels of contagion that have been observed in the literature but have never been put together into a big picture. And I created this very symmetric uh, diagram, which I, you can't understand unless you look at my paper. Mateusz <laughs> 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 um, wanted me to show uh, uh, another inexplicable picture. And this is a model of the economy that was promoted like 40 years ago, and it didn't fit the data. But Mateus um, re found a mistake in the analysis and redid with all the data and found out that business cycles can be uh, in the economy can be described by a very simple model. So um, I'm seeing some, and this last one. He, he, he put it in my slide for me, and I can't really explain what it is. <laughs> but in his model, it tells you where, which, which, where in, in the parametric space you expect to see financial crises developing spontaneously. So. The red spot. <laughs> yes. The key model is a formalization of Bitsky. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just an extension of the uh, Goodwin model, the previous one, and uh, and he's worked really hard off that over the years. He's, he's doing some amazing things with that stuff. So um, that's it. Thanks very much again. Thank you, Tom. I'm kicking it off because I think Jeff wants to that's say Scott's a few words. Oh, okay, Scott. Scott. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. Maybe oh, just start. Thank you. Just hey, one, or, one or two minutes. <laughs> I'll make you quick. Yeah. I, I, I should here. say that even Tom hasn't met the industry partner. <laughs> yeah. His partner, we just his met. partner has met and worked with the industry partner in Shanghai, actually. Uh, so I, I know the whole story. Go ahead. Is this working now? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear now? Yeah. I don't know if the, uh, so, um, I thought I had a few more minutes to speak, so I'll give you the quick version. Uh, <laughs> A way into what we are, we are a Forex and CFD trading company. We were founded back in 1995. One of the co-founders was a professor at U of T, Professor uh, Michael Stump. Uh, where, if, if any of you have actually heard of Oanda before, it's probably because we were the first company to do an online currency converter. So anybody wanted to know how much Canadian dollars is this US dollar uh, purchase I want to do, we had that first. Um, that was very successful, and then we branched to become the first customer, uh, the first company to uh, allow clients to do forex trading. So, if you are interested in in, in currencies, you think the Canadian dollar is going to go up, go down? We provided the first opportunity for people to trade uh, currencies and make a living off of trading currencies. Um, I'm going to skip over over most of the slides in the interest of time. Um, just go back to the the last active research. So. 
In, in last year, in 2017, we did, uh, our customers did a total of $1.3 trillion in, in traded volume over the year. And I'm the head of the, the quantitative analytics team, and, and we have two main problems that we're trying to solve right now. And the, the first problem is how to price these products, because clients are, are trading on our prices. We need to know how we give a price which is fair to customers, give customers a good opportunity for them to trade. And on the other side, because we're a company, how to monetize that on the other hand. Uh, the other side of, of the main um, research topic we're doing is the monetization side. So when a client trades with us, we have to make, we have a trade given to us. So we have to make a risk management decision. Do we want to go and offload our risk with the market immediately or do we want to hold off and wait a little bit longer and then offload the risk? Uh, a lot of the research is around that last part. So we are going to work towards a client classification, you know, how our current client trading behaviors and habits and, and what we can do differently with the different different type of clients. One of the other things that's very interesting with the FX market, and I'll just wrap up for you, is that um, what happens a lot of times is if we go and trade with a bank, uh, what happens very frequently is that bank then will say, okay, I have to offload my risk, and they'll trade with another bank, we'll trade with another bank. So even though the FX market has a perception that it's a very deep, very high liquidity, what you see happen is whenever there's any abrupt events in the market, that liquidity will disappear and you'll get an abrupt, the discontinuous change in the market. Uh, so, what, so what we're looking for is more research to find out is how the market behaves over the standard behavior, volatile periods, and then what happens during these discontinuous markets um, in which develop into systematic risk and also for our business causes a problem for, for the market. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you. So let's move on. Um, so our next presenter is also from University of Waterloo, Professor Nama Chavia. That's fine. He said I can call him sir. <laughs> <laughs> So this has to do with the inference and predictions of uh, large data sets. It is a data-driven model. And this actually is it's going, it's going to be with uh, my colleagues from Waterloo. As a citizen here is one of the persons with whom we'll be working, Sue Ann Campbell. And also I have two colleagues from University of uh, Humboldt University who have been working with me on this for a long time. Uh, the main partners is, uh, is uh, two, the first two uh, companies work in aircraft uh, engine problems. And the last company works with um, uh, projecting uh, de-icing procedures, as well as holdout times for airlines. So I come from the, I, my past job was a professor of aeronautics at the University of Illinois urbana champaign So you see a large amount of aircrafts in this, in this presentation. So bear with me. <laughs> so uh, the main, uh, point actually is to create an environment for innovative uh, research and education in data-centric problems, basically inference and prediction of large-scale systems. That is the main thing uh, that we want, to, we want to establish in this lab. And if you ask the question, uh, the, the great challenges that we have in, 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 in inference and prediction is to understand how do you analyze large data and how to, how to assimilate this data into evolving systems so they can predict it. It has to be done fast, especially for an aircraft. Uh, you know, you're talking about aircraft engine having a problem. I would like to know whether things have gone bad. <laughs> and this is what these companies. So what I want to, put to, to some extent do is to create some niche technology for these small companies so they can actually, based on cutting edge research, so they can actually become leaders in this field. It's sort of an Ontario developed technology for these companies so they can actually compete and become world leaders. And so we have a good foundation that is basically built on a, a university. I come from University of Waterloo. I just, just joined in, in January. So we have a fantastic department of applied math, which is the domain expertise we have. We have people we know about modeling and also techniques. And we have a fantastic stats department with whom we were working with, and CS and engineering gives us technology. So what we want to ask actually is, is it is it possible to find the best possible solutions based on the cutting edge research that we want to achieve? 
and we want to work with, I think I have a couple of weeks, this slide here. So we want to integrate the strengths of various departments and then produce feedback. I mean, we want to find out for the industry what kind of problem they want us to solve, which will create new relevance. So, so this is a typical, the first company wants us to do. So all of you know an aircraft engine uh, is actually one of the most expensive components in aircraft. Uh, it is actually, uh, it is reliable. It is built to be very reliable at a very high expense, of $25 million for a jet engine. Right? And if you have two jet engines, it's close to $50 million. And operating cost on a jet engine over Atlantic is about $50,000. Right? So the question actually is, how do I manage and how do I maintain these jet engines without failure? And this is the, this is the precise problem they would like to ask. And what we want to do is to, so you basically ask the question, if you, if you look at this uh, set of equations you have, this is your system model, which we don't know precisely, the large amount of uncertainties in the systems, the large amount of noise components that go into the system. So the whole idea actually is how do I take all this uncertainty and predict the future of these engine components. And the second uh, point actually, this is a problem that uh, the, the second company is interested in, is to identify automated winter de-icing programs and also create hold over times. So you de-ice your aircraft and you ask yourself how much time I have before you have ice forming on the aircraft. And that's called hold out times. One has to predict these things. To predict these things, one has to know the weather patterns, the snow. Within, within two hours, I should know what is the precise temperature, what is the precise snow rate in the airport. So this is the question of how do I take weather information and create these technologies. So coming back, this is the applied part of the research. The, the interesting part of the research is what do we do as academics? So the first thing is to discovering fundamental structures in data. Uh, this is this is the first part of the of the of the scientific work. Second part actually is how do I assimilate this information? Assimilation of information is given by stochastic partial distribution. So you have a filtering equation for nonlinear systems. These are stochastic partial differentials which has to be solved precisely. The question actually is how do I steer my sensors to place them in the right place to get the best information that can give you accurate readings. That is the third part of this thing. So if I put them together, what we call is dynamic data-driven application systems. This has, the, on the right-hand side, you have random dynamical system, which is your model. You have a, a model of the system, you have a model of the noise, which are given by what we call measure-preserving transformations. On the left-hand side, you have data assimilation problems, which are given by, again, stochastic means. And on the bottom side, you have here information theory. I want to find the quickest change detection. If you have something that has gone wrong in your aircraft engine, I would like to know with a minimum delay, with minimum false alarms, because we don't want to find out. Right? And then the last one is computation. So the computations come from particle methods and graphical models. And so these, this is basically, in a way, this is in a, if you ask yourself, the innovations are going to be at the interfaces of basic research. And the basic research areas are here, if you look at the basic research, you have data assimilation is a basic research area, random dynamical systems of basic research area, information theory of basic research area. In the, in, the, in, the, in the interfaces of these things, you have new innovations which will try to answer these problems. And they all come from some of the work I've just finished uh, in the States. It is actually, it is autonomy. Autonomy is a big thing in the, in, 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 the, in the United States. I've just finished these projects. And the whole idea actually is how do you do autonomous control of autonom autonomous vehicles? And this actually gives you a, a, a small uh, work of what we have done in the past, which has to do with trying to control forest, forest, forest fires in Colorado. I think this should be enough. Thank you.
hoping to move on to the next presenter is Alex Jacobson from the University of Toronto. <coughs> So thank you very much, and thank you to the Fields Institute for this opportunity and for choosing our group as a lab. So our lab will be called the Geometry Processing and Fabrication Lab, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we're interested in, what motivates our work. So as we all sort of know, we're now living in the age of big data. We see amazing applications for video, images, and audio data. Part of the reason for this, besides the explosion of big data, is that we have great algorithms coming from image processing, signal processing, and video processing. We have a long history of research in these areas. My field of research is in geometry processing, which is a much younger field, the idea of treating geometry as a signal that can be processed. So it's not for a lack of geometric data. In fact, we have geometric data all around us, right? If we want to uh, offset the human effect on the world's climate, we have to understand uh, the weather and climate data. These are scalar and vector fields living on the surface of our planet. Uh, self-driving cars have been in the news a lot lately. For self-driving cars to operate effectively and safely, we need to be aware of not just the static geometry of the roads and signage around us, but also the dynamic geometry of other cars and pedestrians crossing by. Here you see an example uh, on the left of medical data being visualized as uh, curves and surfaces virtually on the computer. On the right you see an example of a telesurgery prototype. If we want this to be a reality, we need to process this data uh, in an efficient and accurate manner for the, manner for the uh, specific patient at hand. Uh, in another example here we have an uh, 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 example of uh, uh, clothing uh, opportunities online where you can scan in yourself in front of your webcam or maybe a sensor on your laptop and have an uh, automatic display of the clothing that you might buy and might purchase. And finally getting to a topic that I'm very much interested in, here's an example of uh, 3D printing. You see on the left a 3D printed prosthetic leg and on the right a new shoe from New Balance that uses 3D printing in the sole of the shoe. And of course sort of the bread and butter of computer graphics you have increasing complexity in the ge geometries that are used for uh, interactive video games or uh, visual effects in film. Nowadays, visual effects are, are common across any sort of films. You see them in sort of TV shows like, uh, this is like a, uh, a sitcom that you wouldn't expect was filmed in LA, but actually the entire New York City uh, is just recreated behind them, or even sort of dramatic films, uh, not just blockbuster special effects. So all of these applications require collecting some geometric data, processing that geometric data, and then finally putting that geometric data to some kind of use. But unfortunately, there are many barriers that stand in the way of this task. And so part of this is poor user interfaces. So we know what we want to do, but we can't get at that geometric data because the interface is so bad. Maybe the tools that we have are running too slowly to actually get the feedback to manipulate that geometric data. And finally, geometric data is often very much corrupted by the process by which we gathered that data. Maybe it has noise or artifacts due to the way that it was modeled. So my research is about, well, if I set up the barriers, it's about dismantling these barriers between humans and their geometry that they like to manipulate. So our new lab will develop new algorithms and interfaces to help people create, study, and then fabricate geometry. And one of our uh, short-term goals is to develop new to develop develop new software for what you see at, is what you fabricate in an, an, an analogy with sort of what you see is what you get word processing. Um, let me give you a few of the examples that we have from our latest work in this uh, this area. So the way that we operate is going back to fundamental mathematical questions and a asking how can we answer these kind of questions on the messy sort of data that we find in the wild. So a prototypical example of this is determining whether or not we are inside or outside of a given shape. For example, we want to 3D print some shape. We need to know where should we be squirting the plastic, what's inside of the shape. So here you see uh, the example on the left is actually a representation of a surface of a statue that was scanned from a museum. 
And it's represented just by an unorganized collection of points floating in space. We call these point clouds in our research. And then on the right, you see a design that a user has made in a virtual reality uh, painting tool. They're sort of waving their hand in the air, and they're uh, creating these ribbons, little pieces of surface. And what the user has intended here is to make a pedestal that they can uh, place this statue head on top of. But both of these representations don't really tell us what's inside of the shape or what's outside of the shape. We relied on sort of just a, a classical mathematical uh, integral, we might get lost in this kind of uh, representation. But through our new algorithms, we can not only determine what's inside and outside, but we can join these together and send these messy representations directly to the 3D printing without losing information here. So here on the right, you see a 3D printed result. So in our research, uh, we care about answering these kind of questions robustly, but we want to see them actually working out in practice. And by looking at robustness first, we can then focus on efficiency without sacrificing the, the type of results that we're getting. So here you see another representation of a bunny that's just made up of a sort of messy collection of triangles. And on the right, we have our voxelization. This is something that's very useful in a variety of domains, including uh, uh, computer games and fabrication. Um, and in this example, I mean, you don't know the previous word, but it's a thousand times faster, which is, you know, a thousand is a big number to be faster. That, that's a, a quite remarkable result. Um, one of the things that makes our lab unique, I must have pushed the weird button, is that uh, we're validating our methods on unprecedented amounts of large data. We have that data now, we should be testing on that large data. Uh, here's a result on tetrahedralization, something that's very important for anyone doing finite element method simulations, whether it's in engineering uh, or other areas in, in medicine. Here we had developed a new tetrahedralization software, and we validated it on 10,000 models, all of which were intended for 3D printing. Um, and you see a, a visual display of this here. Uh, our lab uh, contains... Uh, a uh, nice diverse team of researchers, both here in Toronto and visiting researchers that uh, we've brought in with the support of the Fields Institute, and also visiting investigators from uh, Brazil and our academic uh, collaborator who's in France. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Adam. So our next presenter is Ken McCauley from Queen's University. Okay, I'm going to tell you about our. Is this one? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you about something we're calling our Chemical Process Mathematics Lab at Queens. That's uh, that's part of CCAM, and so I'd like to thank all of the fields and CCAM people first. We we're going to call ourselves the Chemical Process industries lab but then if we called ourselves that people think of chemical process industries as like big oil and big chemical companies which we like those things but that's not just what we do we do more things than that and if we put chemical process industries lab then people will think that we have like beakers and reactors and we're doing things in our lab so we took out the industries and we put in the mathematics but you'll see that we have lots of industrial things Okay, so our, ooh, I just have a few slides. So we have some, uh, some objectives. We, uh, we're, in our group, we will see that we're mostly, we're mostly chemical engineers and we interact with uh, mathematicians and statisticians and we are the kind of chemical engineers who are at the interface between chemical engineering and mathematics in industry. So um, what our lab will be doing and what people who have joined our lab have been doing in the past is to develop math models and tools for companies who do a, a wide variety of things that are related to chemistry and chemical engineering. So we're interested in companies involved in fuels and materials and pharmaceuticals and medical devices and people who do waste treatment and also companies that sell services to those companies. So the companies that do process control technology. So we're interested in interacting with all of those kinds of folks. And um, the academic researchers in our labs work on developing new methodologies um, that enable data and models of all of these different chemical phenomena to be used more effectively together so that companies can make 
nice business decisions and operate or what kinds of things they should invest in or do that's new or how to operate their existing assets. So we're interested, um, so companies will use our results for things like uh, designing new products and new processes, improving their processes, scaling up new ideas, monitoring and controlling their existing processes better. And also, um, when they're making these kinds of decisions, accounting for their data and the uncertainty in the, in the models that they have and for planning of new experiments when they need, when they need better information. Another objective that we see is important in our lab is training HQP, who will uh, have lots of nice mathematical skills to go along with some engineering skills so that uh, companies will want to hire them and so that we can all have some more um, sustainable kinds of, kinds of things going on in our economy. And finally, we wanted to find a way that our process systems engineers, which is what we call our mathematical sorts of chemical engineers, that they can engage more um, in more interactions with uh, mathematicians and statisticians because we can we find that we can formulate problems much faster and better than we can always solve some of our mathematical problems and so we wanted to do some more um, interaction with, with real mathematicians so you will see here is our our uh, team is uh, based at Queen's University and you can see the Martin, Shang, Nick, Jim, and Tom are all process systems engineering uh, people in the chemical engineering department at Queen's. Um, Sirdar Bauman and Devin are um, mathematicians and statisticians in our department at Queen's, and they're some of our favorite people who get involved on supervisory committees for PhD theses and things, and we want to do more interactions with them, and so we see this as a nice thing. Also, they see some benefits from us because we can help um, make nice example problems that can help with some of their more theoretical mathematical work that they're involved in. Um, we have um, some collaborators at Ryerson, McMaster, and Waterloo. Those are also more process systems engineers. And these people, um, all of the, the, the chemical engineers on our list, they have a history of being involved with lots of different, uh, different companies. Um, for example, Shang Li has some interactions with DuPont, and uh, I'm going to talk about a project that Martin's involved with. I have um, some, I have contracts right now with ExxonMobil, and Eli Lilly, and uh, Chris Schwartz is doing work with Praxair, and Hector Woodman with, with Sanofi Pasteur, and Luis is doing very interesting work for a company that does chemical analyses. So you send in their stuff and they do analyses and send you back the results, and he's doing very nice work on optimizing which analyses they should do first and last to better serve their customers and keep them all happy and increase how many analyses they can do and how much money they can make over time. And I think that's, oh, this is our first new project. So I talked about the existing things that we were doing before CQAM started. Um, but uh, the two main people who will uh, work on this project with Johnson Controls are Martin Gay, who's a chemical engineer, and Bauman, who is a, uh, a mathematician at Queen's. And it's the, the name of this project is Distributed Extremum Seeking Control of Large-Scale Uncertain Dynamical Systems. So this is about um, optimization of um, control systems and um, especially distributed ones where, where imagine if we were doing the first thing. So in large chemical plants, there's lots of heat integration and energy saving and cooling things up and heating and, and uh, heating them to, to ensure things that are safe and you have the right product quality. And all of these uh, control systems operate independently usually and sometimes they exchange information with each other to get the most optimal use of, uh, of energy. Um, Johnson, so Johnson Controls is in that kind of business, but also they do control systems for, biz, for building HVAC, and so this uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And so this first project is not really a chemical chemical example that they've given uh, Martin Bauman to work on, because if this, if this math that they're doing, if it doesn't really work, well, it's better that people might get too hot or too cool, rather than, than uh, that the heat exchangers in an operating refinery or chemical plant don't work properly. Anyway, 
Um, so this is about controllers communicating to achieve some overall optimal energy <coughs> savings goals. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so let me tell you a few words about uh, this computational methods in the international mathematics lab. But before I, I move to that, uh, I'll tell you a few words about myself, just to give you a background. Uh, so I'm interested in graph theory, uh, both in uh, modeling and mining complex networks. And this program can be viewed as a multidisciplinary program, which combines not only mathematics and computer science, but also social science. So I could call myself a pure mathematician, since I spent most of my time proving theorems. But since I joined uh, Ryerson in 2011, I think, um, since Ryerson has uh, this hands-on uh, twist to doing research, uh, I was encouraged to work with industry partners, and I liked it. So uh, here are a few uh, companies that I used to work with, and um, the, the bottom ones are uh, the ones that I'm still working, in, uh, working with, and um, they're also supporting the lab. Um, so what is the idea? Uh, the idea is that when I talk to uh, uh, industry partners, I see that each of them is trying to uh, increase some efficiency in, in their processes. Um, and this can be done by uh, collecting data, of course, like everyone collects data these days. Um, but also, um, you know, not only data, but you need some data analytics tools um, uh, to take advantage of, of uh, the collection that you have. But also what we see is that uh, very often people would like to do some kind of simulations uh, and optimizations. And that uh, leads us to very sophisticated models uh, that we uh, you know, sometimes can analyze on a piece of paper, but very often uh, require use of a computer. So, um, so we are trying to utilize uh, uh, the cutting edge uh, computational environments using distributed computing and GPUs and cloud computing, etc. That's what we are specializing in. Um, and um, um, what the lab is trying to do is, is trying to uh, narrow the gap between you know, huge demand that we observe from industry partners and, in some sense, lack of tools on our side. Um, and of course, the important part would be training HQPs, as uh, um, you know, this also applies to, to them. Uh, not, not, not everyone know these kind of things, and it's a big need for that. Um, but since we see this huge demand, I think we were going to target two uh, companies. I think uh, we're going to target uh, companies that are large with sophisticated questions so that we can focus on developing new, new tools, and that includes you know, new theorems, new algorithms, something that is publishable in a, in a top journal, because that's what's important for uh, people in academia. But also, we're going to be open to local companies and perhaps you know, apply standard tools um, to help them uh, achieve their goals. So I think we will be going kind of like uh, in two directions. So in terms of uh, our lab investigators, uh, since I'm from Ryerson, uh, many people uh, involved, I'm guessing, will be coming from Ryerson. Uh, and the Department of Mathematics is a, a natural choice uh, here we, we offer a PhD degree in, in uh, math modeling and methods. So um, each, uh, every single group, we have three groups, um, every single group requires uh, some mathematical modeling and computational methods. So I'm expecting a lot of uh, our uh, professors and, and students will be involved and they would like to be. Uh, also I'm working with data science lab of Aisha Benner. So she's also supporting the lab and uh, will be doing uh, work for us. And um, I would expect also computer science to be involved. Uh, but we also are open to um, other institutions. And uh, Warsaw School of Economics, uh, for example, will be playing a big role because they specialize in those kind of simulations, cloud computing, um, et cetera. So uh, they're already uh, involved in many projects that we have. Um, and also MIPT, similarly to Ryerson, they have very hands-on uh, approach to doing research so some of their departments are actually called like Huawei or, or uh, uh, Yandex, 
So they have a very, very um, applied approach and, and uh, very skill, skillful people. So those are uh, lab investigators from uh, academia. And then uh, I know that we are running out of time, so let me just flash like um, some industrial partners. So I mentioned about the, the big players. So uh, I work with Microsoft uh, Research, Google Research, uh, Yandex, uh, which is, uh, I mentioned, the uh, uh, Russian uh, Google, or they call themselves, I guess, Google is a, a US uh, Yandex. Um, so we, we, uh, uh, we, we uh, work with them. And Julia, that we just uh, advertises, this is a language processing which we use and develop. Um, and this is a um, uh, language that is uh, nice as Python, but fast as C. So um, that's what uh, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge research has done. So those are big players. Um, uh, we are also open to local industrial partners. So I work with these three companies. Those are uh, supporting a company for the lab. Um, and I, I will work with them on various uh, projects. Um, and finally, we also work with the government. So actually, Dominic Fernandez is in the audience. Uh, he's uh, um, the director uh, at the Ministry of Attorney General. And I also work a lot with the Pat Institute, which is the part of uh, CSE Canada. Uh, so those are the nine uh, uh, founding industry partners. But we are open uh, uh, and want to work with more. So um, our last speaker is uh, Matt Davison from Western. Pleasure speaker today, and I want to salute uh, the visionary uh, insights of Kwashong and, and Ian for, for putting this, this whole thing together as well as the Ontario government for, for their support. Um, I want to say that, that our lab is, uh, is co-directed by, by me, by Mark Reeser, and by Adam Metzler. And Mark and Adam are at, are at Laurier. Uh, so financial math uh, used to be looking at very simple problems of conceptually simple problems of pricing options, hedging them. The mathematics was difficult, but the problem was easily stated. Uh, nowadays, it's kind of turning around where the problems are very hard to state and uh, sometimes new mathematics is needed, new ways of thinking about things are needed. Um, we are working on, already in my group, lots of industrial collaborations with lots of different uh, entities. So for instance, on the machine learning side, we're looking at uh, interpolating um, noisy, very liquid bond prices and from that, figuring out uh, how, how that relates to this thing called fundamental review of the trading book. That, that integrates um, machine learning and it integrates regulation. And those two things are important. We're doing that with, with partners at Royal Bank and also a different set of partners at TD. Uh, we are working on looking at uh, how to understand the wind industry after uh, the current agreements with the province expire. This is a project called Year 21, and this is done with, uh, with our partners at Enbridge and our partners at um, um, Kruger Energy. And this is funded by a large NSERC CR CRD grant uh, run by my friend and colleague, Ruth Caravo from Windsor. Uh, this is already a, almost too big of a project to fit into, into this, this mechanism, but it brings us lots of contacts and, and connections. Um, I want to talk to you though today just about a single project um, that is uh, with my partners at Goldcorp. Okay, and this this project uh, has it's just the subject of an engage grant, answer engage grant that's recently coming to an end. For those who know about the answer engage program, it's a sort of meet and greet grant between industry and uh, academia, in which the industry gets some money up front without having to put any money in. They've put some, some sweat equity in, some in-kind in, no actual money. The real question with an engaged grant is how to turn it into an ongoing relationship once the free money is gone. Maybe it's the project doesn't scale all the way to a CRD, and that is our vision for our lab, is to do lots of 
relatively small consulting-like projects, great for training students on industrial math, great for bringing research ideas into our group, great for disseminating our skills to the private sector. Um, so let me just tell you just a little bit about this one problem, which, which I really, really like. So this is a picture of a gold mine way northern Ontario. It's 700 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. You want to get there, you got to fly. Uh, and it uses a lot of power. It uses eight megawatts of power to run the mine. It uses five megawatts of power to run the rock crusher that crushes up the gold ore that comes out of the mine. It's relatively easy to shut down the rock crusher. Uh, the rock crusher works faster than the mine, so you can shut it down a few hours a day and it can catch up. It's not so easy to shut down the mine. If you shut down the mine, that costs a lot of money because you have staff working on site and you're paying them whether or not they're working because they're you know, stuck up in this place for two weeks. Okay, so why would you want to shut down the mine? Uh, let me just, oops, um, like that. Uh, you, you would want to shut down the mine to save money. And in particular, you'd want to save money to do with some rules in the Ontario electricity market. So there's something called a global adjustment. And for large industrial users of power, they get billed uh, a significant amount for every megawatt of power they use on the five peak demand hours of the year. Uh, and there's a, some technical details there. Each one of those hours has to be on a different day. Uh, they can't be all, all on the same day. They have to all be on different days. Uh, and the reason for this is to, is to stop the peak load, which is expensive to serve, to, to mitigate that a little. Um, and the problem though is you have to shut down on the top five hours of the year. I need to know today if I'm shutting down tomorrow. I know if tomorrow was one of the top five demand days of the year at the end of the year. So there's, there's a little bit of a decision making problem there. Uh, now this isn't all that uncommon in financial math. We're often making those kind of decisions. When do I exercise my, my call option? Well, I exercise it when it's the best to exercise it. Well, if I know, knew the future, that would be easy and we wouldn't have financial math. <laughs> but instead, we, we don't. So this is a beautiful problem in probability and it gets back to our origins of financial math, which is a nice, simple problem uh, that people haven't really studied all that much. The guy that I'm talking to at Muscle White Mine for Gold Corp, Smart guy, great guy. He's got a bachelor's degree in metallurgy and he's confronted with this problem now that he's, he's, he's managing this, this, this gold mine. He doesn't have you know, six graduate courses in stochastic processes. He's got first year calculus, second year calculus, that's it. He understands the problem, doesn't understand how to solve it. Okay, so um, I described that already, what the problem is. There's one threshold for cutting, shutting the, the rock pressure. That's probably kind of shut that at the drop of a hat. Shutting the mine, much more fundamental <coughs> question, but it's still much cheaper to shut down these machinery than it is to pay the penalty at the end of the year. Okay, so uh, how do you think about this problem? Well, the first way I thought about it was I, I thought about an even simpler problem where you just are going to pay the peak of the year and where all of the loads are just IID, it, it, IID draws from the same distribution, which is a completely terrible model of power use in the province because of course it goes up and down over the course of the year. Um, but write that down as a dynamic program and start thinking what the drivers are, what the right form of the solution is. The right form of the solution involves obviously how, what the highest demand you've seen so far this year has been. There's no point in shutting down in our original problem on a high demand day if there's already been five days higher than that. It also depends on how much time you have left in the year. In contrast, what our partners were originally using is at the beginning of the year they were picking a threshold and they were saying if it's above the threshold shut down. That's it. So they had a very static uh, solution and that can't be the right answer. This can't possibly be the right answer. It's got to be a dynamic uh, threshold. So the question is, what dynamic threshold should you use? And after thinking about it quite a while, we ended up with a really, really simple model that works really, really well. And that uh, basically just has you um, 
integrate what's happened so far this year with what happened at the rest of last year starting from today, possibly with some scale factors for, uh, for how you expect load to shift over the course of the year. This ends up working really well. This is back tested. You would have got four out of five of the peaks um, in 2007, 2008. By the way, the year begins on May 1st, if you didn't know. Um, and uh, you, um, you would have shut down five times here. You would have shut down four of the right times, one of the wrong times, which was actually the sixth highest peak of the year, and you would have missed one of the peaks. And the point is here is you have the, it gives you a time varying threshold. You can code that up actually in Excel. Uh, I, I can't actually, but one of my bright students can code it up in Excel. Um, okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for your time. We have to have more labs, but not everybody can make it here. So um, I was told that the description for all the labs will be live by the end of this day. So if you want to know more, you can go to the CCAM website. So I'm going to actually um, pass to Arvind. So I'm sorry I eat into your time. So, um, so the idea is actually we have this uh, panel discussion. So I'm going to invite all the lab leaders come to the front. And we'll have some tough questions for them to answer. They have shown us a wide variety of problems. So yes, please. And then, And um, so we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we're trying to see whether we can still do a meaningful discussion before our next event. Yes, sir. We have a stool here also. That's me, you are the so good afternoon, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arvind Gifla, I'm a professor at UBC, soon to be at U of T, and also a proud member of the field board of directors. Um, we thought it would be interesting to have a panel discussion with some of the CCAM leaders, get their perspective on the network and the kinds of things the network should be doing. Uh, now I'm told that we cheated and sent them a list of questions so that they could prepare, so I'm not going to use these questions. <laughs> my own questions. Um, but we do have somebody in the audience. Steve, how come still here? He just left. Okay, well, I'll introduce him when he comes back. Um, but the first thing that occurs to me that CCAM has many similarities to what we did in my tax. 18 years ago, 19 years ago, a long time ago. 1999. 1999, right, so this is 2018. 19 years ago. And some of you were leaders or investigators in MITAX. So I'm curious what you think we learned from the MITAX experiment and how, you know, have we learned from that in building CCAM? Have we reflected that into CCAM? Or are there things we should still learn from MITAX and build? As, as CCAM develops. So, you know, we're mathematicians, we're supposed to get a pattern matching. So we have, now of course, now we've got AI, so we have a sample. Um, we can think of um, the old MITAX as giving us some of the data. Um, so what did we learn from the MITAX experiment, and how do we reflect that in the CCAM? So, and Matt, you seem to be nodding a lot when I say this, so <laughs> you clearly have thoughts. Okay, so I, I do. Um, I was I was a MyTax project leader way back in the day. In fact, it was my first experience at academic leadership, and, and now I'm a dean, so I guess you can draw a data point from that. <laughs> um, whether it's a good one or not, I don't know. But uh, what I think MyTax, um, MyTax in many ways is similar. You needed industrial problems, industrial money, a focus on training students, just like just like CCAM has. Um, maybe my tax was a little bit more geared on building uh, building cross country networks. Um, obviously, this is Ontario focused, so we're already we're already sort of narrowing the geographic scope, which I think is actually has some positive elements to it. It makes it easy, makes things easier to manage if everybody's more or less in the same place. 
Um, but other than that, I think we, you know, and I think you, um, you know this already, Art, but I think we've we've taken a lot of the positive elements of my tax and them into this new tax. Tom, it seems like a, another part of the need for the new leader. I think a geographic um, kind of being in a condensed state is better, and having fields hosting it is a really great change because I think it's more opportunities to get together. Um, my tax was very diffused. It, we had annual meetings, which was great. My tax is wonderful, by the way, <laughs> for, uh, for your, your, uh, your management of that great thing. I think that created so many new um, ways of thinking in Canadian mathematics. And I guess that predates the Pacific Institute. I mean, not quite. But, uh, Close. but anyway, uh, but this, this is, it's got a few new things I noticed. I mean, more opportunity for smaller scale meetings and maybe training workshops and other uh, things. That hasn't really been talked about so much. Maybe I'm not fully apprised of how that's gonna work, but it seems because we're so close together, we should be able to have a lot more events here at Fields and also in the, in, 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 in the universities that lab here in our city. So that's a big Yeah, and I think just so that everybody's aware, a big difference between CCAM and MyTabs, and that we kind of turned on its head, is that CCAM is much more focused on networking, much more focused on bringing international experts to work with the labs and teams, so thematic programs, to, Try to find more mechanisms to network the teams both with each other and with international experts. And I think it was something we didn't put enough emphasis on MyTax. And of course, you used to point out the regional flavor. <coughs> Kim, you were also a MyTax team leader. I was. I think a great thing that MyTax did that, that I understand CCAM will continue to do is not insisting on owning any of the IP, but just doing some good and connecting mathematics with companies and, uh, and building capacity. That's important. One thing that my tax was marvelous for is it allowed people to match international money. And I know that since we are here in Ontario, this is an Ontario thing. I, I don't know that we'll be able to match international uh, money from international companies, but uh, but that was a really remarkable thing that my tax was able to do. Did anybody else want to add? I'm not sure if anybody else was part of the my tax project. Um, so what I'm going to do is keep coming back to the audience if you have questions, and you know I can think of hundreds of questions, but I'm going to start with opening the floor up. What would you like to ask these eminent scientists um, that are leading, leading the CPAM labs? Ted. Um, this is not for any particular person, but I'm just wondering, is, is, do you think there should be or is there some formal structure in place? so that a year or two or three from now when you get lots of interesting results, and I have to say I was pretty impressed by the talks that I just heard and, and excited about some of these things, um, all of them pretty much. I think there should be a formal structure so that you can brag about what you did uh, over you know, two or three years from now, and, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about what that structure might look like. Because we don't want to hide results of the successes. So do you think we should have like an annual meeting where we invite the, you know, the outside world to come and listen to the results? Well, maybe you should hire somebody to do a podcast. Oh. And, and oh, so that the average person can find out and well, understand we have a communication person what the success of CCAM here. <laughs> Alice. Because this is funded by the government, so ultimately you have to get voters right. to appreciate what has been done or right. what is going to happen in, in my way of looking at things. Good point. So, uh, just to my colleague, uh, Sri, who uh, has experience of this in uh, the U.S. context, uh -huh. you know, so I was wondering whether there are any aspects there that may translate to... Uh, uh, yes, I think there's a... First of all, the U.S. context, we are forced to do this. I came from an uh, engineering college, and we are forced to interact with, with uh, industry from day one. Uh, so you have the applied side of work and the theoretical side of work. 
And it has to, the, the point actually is after two years, three years, we have to deliver the industry what we promise. And it is also, especially with uh, defense-oriented uh, grants, it is completely monitored by the government to make sure that you deliver what you have. And this actually, so these partnerships are there for a longer period. And most of the time, these graduate uh, PhD students, they will join this industry, and they become uh, ways to get money paid. How do you bridge this? So, I mean, you know, lots of people say to me, this industrial research is not what the universities were set up to do. And so, you know, I talk with industry people, they say, why can't, why do we find it so hard to get academics to focus on these particular problems? And, you know, so how do we bridge this academic industry? So, for problem? example, in every MSF proposal, we have to talk about the role of the industry. If you come from industrial impact, industrial impact, uh -huh. the impact. And that sort of forces to think as to how you can package what, what, whatever you do. You have to publish your theoretical paper, but you have to also see how you can take this to the next level. Right? And that actually is, uh, is, is useful. I've, I've worked with uh, uh, Boeing, which was Michael Douglas before, and uh, we have had a long lasting relationship. Can I just jump in about the um, question of how do we represent ourselves to the public? I, my feeling is that it is this, um, in, in a way, I, I'm not familiar enough with the rule book as it is, but I think it's evolving rather quickly. I think there weren't a lot of strings attached to the funding for the pilot program. I mean, I, 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 I don't know, I'm, I'm asking questions starting to ask a lot of questions like this right now about what strings are attached, what are who are eligible industry partners and who are not, and, and questions of that. I think it is, in my mind, we haven't yet um, worked out how we're going to submit the renewal. Um, and so, to, and, and that's an ongoing discussion, but I, I think it starts here with people in the room. I think it's the first time that we've been able to have an informal meeting at least to discuss so, these things. So one interesting part of this, maybe I, I can do a little of history here. Uh, there were two things I think that impressed the government. One was the potential for mathematicians to think about the next big thing. And government is aware, whether we're talking about nanotechnology or quantum, computing or AI, a lot of these techniques are very mathematical. So the idea of having mathematicians think about new techniques is really exciting. So we have an opening there. And the second is students. They really fought this argument that giving students quantitative training is what is needed for a successful society. And of course, we do have a new government at Queen's Park, but I think these are underlying themes that cut across any government. So when we think about messaging, these, these messages resonate with government. And of course, we will need all of your projects to highlight these types of things back to the government. So, so, so is there a plan, let me put this in front, is there a plan to track your students for the next five years? And is it, are people gonna be required to like write down and say where your students went to? Because this sort of longitudinal thing is, is, very, is very good data to have. Well, I think that's something that CCAM will have to do yeah. with the labs. I would argue that was one of the successes of my class. We track the students better than other networks, so we could. But I also remember that the reporting was quite quite onerous on the people that were involved. So that was a big string that that, that we actually felt. So I mean, it's a lot of work to do the micro reporting <laughs> of all of your achievements. That is a lot of work. I mean, we're prepared to do it because we want this project to succeed in the two year time, time horizon, but we have to, we also have to be aware that um, the annual reports are, are quite a, quite a. Well, the good thing, Tom, is that here we get to decide what to report because yes. you know, the province doesn't have a mechanism to do that. Right, but, that's what I say, there's no strings apparently, but we've got to now start writing, creating our own strings. Right. There's got to be some right. reporting structure. And also today's presentation, I could see this large amount of relationship between the cross-projects. Cross yes. So, 
I'm not sure what um, the money is that you're given and what it's to be used for, but are you actually going to be recruiting students specifically for these projects? <coughs> And if so, are you going to be advertising? Partly existing students can add something on or do something new in their in their project that they wouldn't do before, or some new students. The time frame is two years, so it's not as if you can you know plan for a PhD student to work on something for a whole four years. Unless unless it, it's really wonderful that you can build a relationship with the company, and then we can renew CCAM, and if not, then we can just keep going with the company and have some other mechanism for the interaction. Some of the, I have already sent uh, applications for four projects. So hopefully it will be possible. Something I found successful in the past is to have a PhD student who might be doing quite a theoretical project um, pick up one of these other projects, sort of a little, spend a little bit of time on it, get exposed to industry, meet people in industry, figure out what you need to do in industry. Um, I would have said until a few weeks ago you shouldn't wear a tube to work during the day, and then I was at a hedge fund where everyone's wearing a tube during the day, so I don't want to say anymore. But um, the point is people, the PhD students get a taste of, of a really applied pro project as well as doing a theoretical project, and that, well, that's a nice thing. Part of the reason for my question was that I'm from, uh, not from Ontario, so I'm just wondering if if there was going to be positions related to these new labs, if they were going to be advertised somewhere, so students from other province or... That's a great idea. Um, I think that's a really could, great idea. Could something we don't do with our past. Could apply. Or, yeah. Let's just try to... That gets visibility. Where CCAM is just collect, you know, what we're looking for students and, and advertise it. But, you know, something you said that I thought was interesting that the students you brought up is the role of students in these collaborations. So new ways to train students because we have industrial collaborators, not despite the industrial collaborators. And you know, I think that mathematicians are in a particularly good space because we don't have big lab infrastructure to deal with. But what are your plans to use to lever your industrial collaborations in the training of your students? To, to force them to go and spend some time to do make a few trips. To the, to the industry and you know, try to find the real problems that they're thinking of. And I think you need to know the real industry problems. So you have to have a good trips and invite them to come to the company. So you have your students spend time in the companies? Not yet. No, but is that what you're proposing? Yeah, that's what I'm proposing. At least a couple of weeks. Oh, you want to see? Yeah, so. Um, so answer your question, I think uh, in my case, 99% of the budget is always pumped to uh, graduate students and, and postdocs. Because you know, as you mentioned, we don't have any labs. We're not building any machines. Uh, the cloud computing uh, that I'm using is, is rented from Amazon like everyone else is doing these days. So that's usually what companies pay for. So 99% of, uh, of the grant money that I receive from different sources are spent for, for HPPs. Um, and, uh, and and I have HPPs kind of theoretical ones and, and practical ones. So the theory ones, you know, I'm kind of happy because all of them get uh, tenure track positions. But uh, I'm not worried about uh, those uh, kind of applied ones at all because they usually find a job much earlier than even sometimes before the project ends. So that's my you know uh, my my problem with uh, theoretical postdocs is always you know make sure that they are finding a tenure track position after my postdoc. Uh, but then with practical ones, you know, I usually the one trying to uh, find some substitution because they usually absorbed by the industrial partners. So I think it's a good idea to keep track of all of that to, to you know, have something on a paper, but I'm not worried about them at all. So they, they're usually ahead of the game and uh, industrial partners absorb them very well, very, very quickly. So, can we change topic a little? Can I just add yes. one point? I think, um, one of the idea is to actually encourage, even though those labs are based at particular universities, that they are encouraged to actually collaborate with people outside the university, but also outside the province. So I think if you found one of those labs is interested in you know, collaborating, so you should talk to them. And so let me build on what Washan just said. Uh, we're noticing lots of international interest in this type of thing. I think Canada's becoming known and very good 
at building, in an, I'll say in an intellectually honest way, collaborations with industry. Um, so, you know, these are supposed to be high academic standards, but also collaboration with industry, do fundamental research that's related to industrial problems, good training for students in collaboration with industry. And so I get asked by, you know, when I travel internationally, how can we participate in these kinds of activities that are going on in Canada? We like to send our students to participate in these activities because these are not available in other countries. So do you think your labs could be a landing ground for a one-year visit by a student from some country? Is that something we can imagine trying to create uh, a way to really use labs as a link? Another way we could do it is we could um, establish some coach hotels where we have a student and a student who's at an international university and one here in Canada where they'll get two PhDs for the same thesis. So if anyone wants to know how to do that, call me. I can uh, tell you now that I've finished my job as associate dean of grad school at, at McMaster, uh, I know how to write coach hotel agreements. So uh, if, uh, but I think that that's a, that's a really great way to establish international collaborations between academics at, at two universities and have students go back and forth yes. quite seamlessly. Other thoughts? There's definitely a need for that, I think. So the question is only if uh, the program allows to do that. But uh, if it is the case, then I don't see any problems. And uh, definitely I hear a lot from uh, students and in industrial partners from outside of Canada that they would like to come. So I bring, uh, uh, for many of my projects, I bring people from Poland or Russia. Uh, and then very often they stay as a permanent resident of Canada. So I think that's also beneficial for Canada and government. Area, uh, that you bring those high quality personal <coughs> you know, permanently. But if, if that's you know, possible uh, under this program, then I think uh, definitely there is a, a opportunity there. I think there's a great opportunity for synergy with existing programs too, so fields, workshops, and thematic programs are bringing people internationally. Um, one of our collaborators, we're sending a student to the MITEX uh, mobility program uh, to spend nine months there, you can imagine it's a similar sort of program to think back, so. So do you collaborate with IMA, for example, in Minnesota? They have a lot of on the industry uh, connections. We, and we have maybe, in the U.S. Uh, yeah. therefore, yes, so but we haven't had any we official haven't. relationship, so we, we do know people there. Yeah. 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 That actually, that is one of the, like, one of the research that works with the industry that I love. So, what would you see at the end of the two years, you know, when you go back uh, uh, to, to sort of go back and say this has worked solidly, is it a continuing relationship with the industries that are involved or is it uh, uh, showing question. that HQP has been placed yeah. in various of these countries? Well, the, the goals that we put into the application, of course, some multi-dimensional thing, were that we really advanced the state of research and industrial mathematics on specific hard problems with companies that they increasingly buy into this mechanism for relating to the universities, that you know, instead of going through the normal channels, yeah. we construct initiatives where they, inter where they work with each other. And the training part, of course, and all sorts of assets training, but also that we can bring the international community to collaborate. And this idea that, that Ontario has to be at the international forefront in some areas is very powerful, and so, if we see these labs developing new techniques that are relevant to the world, where the experts are in Canada but linked up with international experts, I think that at least the government, when we talked with them, they found that very exciting. And it's not lost on government that they feel that some of the areas where Canada has really taken leadership, like AI and quantum computing, it was through these international networks. So can we create more of these kinds of networks through this pilot program? Of course, there is a new government in Queen's Park, so we'll have to figure out whether <coughs> some of the same you know, goals resonate with them. I'm just going to ask one last question. What time do we need to finish, Rosh Five o'clock. Oh, five o'clock. Oh, Dr. Sanjeev Talwar, we have actually hired many people from universities to work with in BMO. So what, what kind of uh, procedures do you guys do? Uh, well, one of the things uh, um, when I was in South Africa was there was actually difficult to find professors to work with, I will, I'll be honest. Um, I ran most of the quantitative analytics and, and you know, uh, you know, some people in the, in the finance department at Rockman, uh, I don't really know fairly well, um, but in general,
general finding, uh, finding people to work with on problems that interested both of us, uh, and managed to get through some of our data security for data uh, and whatnot was, was a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, finding uh, students, PhD students, that actually wanted to work on real industrial problems versus uh, versus theoretical problems also was, was a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so I tended to like to hire more engineers to save up positions because engineers wanted to solve the problem, not necessarily find a new hero or something like that. So yeah, you know, just uh, some things that I found difficult. That's great. Insight. Actually, that was my question also because um, I'm here today, but I'm not a mathematician. I'm an engineer, rather. Perhaps a quantum. So I guess uh, I think that's about community will benefit from integrating in engineers with them because they know the language. They're, they can work like an interface between you with your language and, between, and with the industry with, with their language. Whereas when you want to talk to industry with your language, sometimes I guess it won't work. Yeah, I think this is a really good point. This has to be a multidisciplinary initiative. And the interface with industry can often be mathematicians working with an underdiscipline to talk to that industry. So a number of you are not in mathematics departments, but probably about half of you are in mathematics departments and half in non-mathematics departments. We all think of you as having, you know, being part of our community. Um, I'm also not in mathematics department, but, um, but I think it's a, it's a very good point. Pecker, you had your hand up. Uh, what I was going to ask was that uh, one of the labs actually noted that uh, they have a an initial, they have a relationship with the attorney general in the province. Uh, it seems like one of the uh, underdeveloped relationships with between research activities and the government is actually the need of policy needs and research activity with that are within government itself. Uh, talking with various deputy ministers at different times, they, they tend to find it uh, interesting how they might be able to connect, connect more directly. The uh, uh, people who actually can solve problems with the sorts of problems they actually have internally. Um, any comment on that? Any possibility you know, there? It's interesting because the governments are 32% of the Canadian economy. Yeah. Just from that perspective, it's a huge opportunity. I, echo, I, I just echo this question. In fact, I just literally yesterday or two days ago asked, uh, with the Bank of Canada, are they actually eligible as industry partners? I think they weren't eligible for my tax because they were, there's a conflict of funding in this, but here it's different. So, um, but our project is fundamentally the primary target is Bank of Canada. Uh, was Bank of Canada. So Bank of Canada was not, well, it's a very tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. Right? So Bank of Canada was eligible, but not through their granting program. They were eligible if somebody within the Bank of Canada wants to do research with you. But they also give money to universities as grants. That is not eligible for matches. But, but we haven't, I don't think we've gotten that far in CCAM to figure all these things out. I think out. the government but as, 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 as a receptor, as yeah. and the government as a receptor is, is a huge opportunity. I think there are two different questions. One is uh, whether we have plans to work with government, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, we've been actually trying to talk to the government. Whether the spelling issue is different, I think. So I think probably you have uh, the attorney general one. Maybe you right. want to So Dominic is in the audience, so we can directly ask him questions. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my, uh, uh, my experience, and uh, for me, is everything is connected, right? So of course, you know, how to spend money, that's a different issue, and usually it's, the answer is yes, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, like we can spend money uh, from this program for some other purposes, but it doesn't mean that we don't, we cannot collaborate, right? So I work a lot with the TAT Institute, and it's even worse situation because uh, most of the research there is, is uh, classified, right? So uh, I even won't be able to tell you what we talk about, right? So, so this is even a different level of, of, you know, not only like you cannot found it, but uh, you know you, we cannot talk about it. So, um, so here the situation is much nicer because we can talk about uh, our research uh, and found it from different sources or just you know work on the problem because we are at the end of the day we're mathematicians that care about interesting questions. 
So if you can help them, even without uh, support, it's great. So I think yeah, so I think that answers so the same I'm way. Sure so we want to work. Well, I want to make a quick comment. So I have one. I think it's really great that we're all here in very different areas of application because sometimes the mathematics that we will use and need to use will overlap. So I want to talk to Sri later because he can have a very nice stochastic differential equation in our chemical process things. We worry about estimating parameters and uncertainties associated with stochastic differential equations. <laughs> so we need to like talk, but if we if we hadn't come here, we would never exactly. know this about each other. So I think so that it's going to lead to nice need, connections. We need to create mechanisms. And mathematics is what pulls us together. Yes. Okay. So if I can add to you, Ken, who's going to document that at the end of two years so that you can explain <laughs> to the funders, this is why you have to fund everything under one umbrella so that you can have these collaborations. Because otherwise you could just say, well, let's fund the granting councils. And You'll have to save the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somebody has to remember this so that it can be told as a story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Ken, I think the right thing is that when we ask for the reporting, we want to capture those kinds of KPIs, right? They're not the traditional KPIs. Some of this activity, cross fertilization, may be more important because it can't be done through standard granting programs, right? So lots of people say we produce students, but maybe we're training our students in a different way, or we're cross fertilizing ideas in a different way. We can tease those things out as we develop the reporting mechanisms without making them too onerous, um, I think we'll, we'll be far significantly ahead of the game. And of course, we need to be able to tell our stories all the time. And you know, we're talking with Alex about how we can do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an important aspect, actually, because you know, beating your drum. I mean, when I used to go across to Princess Margaret Hospital, they're, they're very good at that. The foundation, you know, when they get the money, they'll have a reception. The mayor will be there. And you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we have a cure for this from this funding? You know, that, I mean, you don't have to go to that extreme, but at least, uh, you know. But we're also curing cancer, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last that? minute words of wisdom from any of you? Well, let's join me in thanking.